Alrighty, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Melissa Procco. I'm the research librarian here at the Orange County Regional History Center, and I will let our panelists introduce themselves. Um, I can go first. Uh, <laughs> hi, um, I'm Desiree Stennett. I'm a reporter at the Orlando Sentinel. Um, generally speaking, I write about issues related to race and identity. And I'm Monavette Cordero. I'm also a reporter at the Orlando Sentinel. Um, I cover courts and other types of uh, criminal justice issues. Um, and yeah. All right, so we'll jump right into the first question. Oh, that did not work. Um, why did you decide to become a journalist and how did you get your start in journalism? Um, we'll have Monavette start first since you started second that time. <laughs> Um, I decided to become a journalist um, involuntarily, I think. I, um, I had told my parents I wanted to do a psychology major at, at uh, the University of Florida. And so they went to like the class, like preparing for uh, the psychology program and I wasn't there. I was like somewhere else. This is during orientation. <laughs> I went to the journalism thing. <laughs> and I, I don't remember exactly like how it happened, but I know that I ended up there and I was thinking that like, journalism is way more interesting than psychology. <laughs> so um, I went to UF um, and I started as an intern at the um, Gainesville Sun and they liked uh, my work. And so they hired me uh, to cover cops and uh, other uh, police agencies. And um, yeah, and so from there, I, I went to um, the Ledger uh, and the Winter Haven News Sheet. It, was, it used to be like a double paper um, in uh, Polk County. And then after that, I went to the Orlando Weekly where I worked there for um, almost uh, five years. And uh, I started at the Sentinel in 2019. Have you always covered criminal justice? Yeah, weirdly enough. Well, uh, I, I mostly covered criminal justice at the weekly. I was able to get into like politics and environmentalism and health and um, different topics depending on the on the uh, week uh, because um, they only had like one news reporter. So it was like, <laughs> every beat is yours. You can touch anything, <laughs> go ahead. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but yeah, you, know, you circle back to topics that you um, lean more towards anyway. So yeah, um, Desiree, what about yourself? So um, I was one of those kids that I guess kind of knew what I wanted to do since I was a child. Um, I, I credit my third grade teacher <laughs> for it. Um, I remember we had to do like a, what do you want to be when you grow up exercise that people make children do. Um, <laughs> and at the time, I think what I wanted to be was a poet. And uh, my teacher suggested um, journalism instead as a more stable um, career path, which is hilarious now for anyone who's in journalism. <laughs> um, it's probably equally as stable as poetry. Um, but it was then that I, I realized that there were real people working at the newspaper, writing the news and preparing this paper every single day. And I, I thought it was the, the coolest thing. Um, so in high school, uh, my, I, I grew up in Miami um, and Dade County just has a really good like uh, student journalism program. So my middle school had a newspaper and in sixth grade, I was on the middle school newspaper um, that carried through high school. For a very brief moment, I too was a psychology major. Um, <laughs> It lasted the length of the time it took to apply to college. And by the time I got to orientation, I was also done with psychology. Actually what happened, I don't know what it is of that orientation period where you realize psychology is not for me. Yeah, that's not for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I um, went to Florida State. We did not have a formal print journalism program. So um, at the end of my junior year, I transferred to FAMU, which is not the ideal time to transfer to a new school. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but I transferred to FAMU and um, I knew I wanted to do journalism. I um, was very focused at that point because I really needed to graduate. Um, so I was determined to get internships um, and I was lucky enough to, to graduate with the job. I was working at the Tallahassee Democrat very briefly. And then I actually came to the Orlando Sentinel um, shortly after I graduated. And uh, like Monavet covered, um, policing and crime and courts, um, sort of the breaking news uh, stories where uh, I was on that team. Um, and then after maybe three or four, four years at the Orlando Sentinel, um, I, I got the thought into my head that maybe when I was in third grade, I didn't know what I was talking about. And maybe I was too young to decide my whole life. Um, so I left journalism for a bit. I did copywriting for small businesses um, for about two years, traveled, lived in Asia for a little bit, um, stayed in Mexico for a bit, hung out in LA for a bit and everything was remote and it was great. But um, eventually I did miss journalism. And um, from there I slowly came back and wrote about uh, personal finance for a bit and then business and um, understanding this new aspect of journalism that I hadn't covered before um, led me into wanting to write about race and um, in all kinds of lenses through the criminal justice lens like my former back my original background in journalism gave me but also through economic justice through environmental justice uh, healthcare justice all kinds of um, ways that race uh, intersects with life and um, I'm lucky enough to have this position now where I get to do that. I think it's interesting that you both had an initial interest in psychology. Like I it's think almost it's a like, thing. yeah, yeah, like, it's, like a, yeah. you're interested in exactly. the people, and then as a journalist, you get to write about and report about people and their experiences. So that's an interesting connection that I didn't realize when we were talking before. Um, so I think part of it is about like what you, what your parents, and my parents are immigrants and I know Desiree's parents are also immigrants. And it's part of what your parents see as feasible for like uh, economic reasons, like what job could actually bring you money. And so when you say as a child, oh, I want to be a writer, everyone's like, uh, <laughs> yeah. So you kind of pivot to psychology and then you, I think pivot to like something that involves something that you love and could potentially pay you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the time we thought. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we're gonna get into the next question. So I'm gonna try to sprinkle in a little bit about Central Florida history. Um, so you guys are both Sentinel reporters and a woman journalist by the name of Emily Bavar back in 1965 was sent to California um, to cover the Disneyland's 10th anniversary. And while she was there, she got to interview Walt Disney and asked him if he was the one purchasing the 30,000 acres that no one knew who the buyer was. It was a mystery industry. Um, and she, while in California, reported that she thought it was Disney. Um, and then less than a month later, he's sitting at the Cherry Plaza Hotel announcing his plans for Disney World in Orlando. And while I couldn't find any mention of what her favorite story was, um, I feel like this would be a good segue into hearing about what of your guys' favorite stories to work on been. I will let Desiree go first this time. <laughs> sure. Um, I'll say at this point, I've been in journalism so long <laughs> that <laughs> I, I feel like I've written so much. Um, I, I, but I think that the story, and this is not even like a, a career making story or anything like that, but I'll say this is the first story that got me into the kind of work that I do now. Um, while I was freelancing, um, I was living in St. Pete, Florida uh, for uh, about two years. And um, when I was there, I lived downtown and, um, and I write about race, so I talk a lot about race, but um, if, I don't know, if you've been to down, if you live in downtown St. Pete, um, I think there's a, just going out, hanging out at restaurants, bars, and experiencing nightlife there, um, it'll lead you to believe that uh, there are no <laughs> Black people in St. Pete, uh, for lack of a more eloquent way to say that. Um, and 
I often felt that way that I was just in this very tiny minority while I was there. And then um, one night I was out with a friend and we went and visited an art gallery on the south side of town. And it was like a different world on that side of town. And I think that was the first time I asked myself, what's going on here that you go five miles in one direction and you live and it's an entirely different city. And I ended up writing a story about how um, desegregation and the highway system and tourism being um, St. Peter's historically being um, the main industry in, in St. Pete sort of shaped the city and, and really created um, racially segregated neighborhood that still very much exists today. And it was a whole story about that history, plus um, the forward looking of St. Pete sort of exploding as a city now, and um, the, the gentrification that comes with that, and the, the decisions made by the city. And it was a freelance piece for a magazine um, out in California. And it was really that first story that made me realize that there is a race story to be told in almost everything. And um, I've, again, been lucky enough to write a lot more stories um, since then, but that one will, I think, always have a place in sort of defining this current stage in my career. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like you said it, um kind of led to realizing that this is what you enjoy writing about. And this is a, a topic that is worthy of and needs to be discussed more. I mean, as you're saying that, I heard a lot of parallels to how even, even Orlando is with I-4 going through Paramore and then us being such a tourism uh, area as well. Mm -hmm. So what about you, Monavet? Um, I think Desiree's point is right about like finding how race and ethnicity like affect every single story Mm -hmm. um, that you cover. And before getting to the Sentinel, I think my favorite stories at that point had been um, covering the Pulse massacre and covering um, uh, the Hurricane Maria survivors who arrived in Central Florida and really like delving deep into how race, ethnicity, and like language um, barriers like affected their response mm -hmm. to like the trauma that they were living and like how they like dealt with that moving forward. Um, since I got to the Sentinel, um, I was allowed to delve into guardianship and that has been my favorite story so far because I just was given time to do what I wanted on that. Um, uh, guardianship for people that don't know is um, when the court appoints um, someone to make basically every decision that you can conceive of. Um, for an incap incapacitated person, um, you know, usually like elderly people, people who have uh, mental disabilities. And it came to light because of a um, guardian in Orlando named Rebecca Burley, who um, decided to take out or to sign a do not resuscitate order on behalf of one of her um, incapacitated clients um, against his wishes and the wishes of his like family and his uh, psychiatrist. And he ended up dying uh, because uh, uh, you know the hospital staff could not revive him. Um, and all of this kind of cascaded into a look at how guardianship works in Central Florida um, and just like the huge problems within the industry in terms of like conflicts of interest, um, you know, the disciplining of guardians, um, how easy it is to uh, be, be in a guardianship or, or to get under in a guardianship, but how hard it is to get out. And so um, it's it's sad stuff, but I it's my favorite story to have worked on because I um, met um, a lot of, you know, um, wards who um, were very brave, the families of these people that were brave in, in telling their story and um, allowing, uh, us to help them tell their story. So um, that's been my favorite story to work on, just the investigative aspect. And and we did, um, uh, we were cited in the law change that happened in 2019. Um, so our efforts um, made a difference in that aspect. And for that, I'm, you know, proud of that. I think it's really interesting too, because if someone doesn't 
have to go through that guardianship process or know what it's like, they don't know all the intricacies and what could be so difficult about it. So that's an interesting aspect of reporting too. But you said something that made me think um, that you were given time to work on this story. Are, yes. <laughs> is a time crunch that you guys have to deal with in reporting, is that something that um, challenges you more, drives you more? How, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think just working for like a, a daily newspaper, you know, you have to feed the beast every day. That's the, mm -hmm. the motto. And so you have to churn out stories and, and some of these investigative pieces take a much, uh, much longer time and effort, a lot of more, a lot more reporting. So it can be, um, it can be hard to turn those around when, you know, uh, for example, at the weekly, like if you're the only reporter or if you're the, you know, one of a few reporters of a smaller newspaper and you have to fill up the newspaper with like three to four stories a day, it can be like virtually impossible mm -hmm. to do those types of stories. So that's why I am grateful to be working at the Sentinel where like my editor uh, has given me the space to do that. I think it's really interesting to the role that investigative journalism plays in uh, bringing some issues to light, which is a good transition to our next question. Um, how would you describe the role of journalism in our society and do you see that changing at all in the future? Um, we'll let uh, Desiree go first since we had a side question there. Sure. Um, I, personally, I think um, journalism at its best uncovers things that don't get talked about enough or people did not know. And, and particularly, I think, uncovers things that are harming groups of people and corrects them in some way. I think that when journalism works, it gives a voice to people who generally don't have power to stand up to the most powerful among us on their own. Um, and it, it makes, I think, our elected officials, business leaders, anyone that has influence, it, it forces them to acknowledge wrongdoing, I think. And when they claim that they intend to fix it, I think we hold them to their word. Um, I think that there is a lot. Um, the second half of this question is, do you see journalism changing? I think that journalism is always changing. I think that what exists today, people who retired 50 years ago probably could never imagine what it's like to work in the journalism environment now that it's so fast paced. Um, the role that technology plays in it, all of it. But I think fundamentally, um, I hope that journalism does not lose that need for truth seeking and that need to to correct wrongs um, when we can. And I don't think we're always successful at that. And I, I know, I mean, as the country has changed, as our world has, has changed, I think that um, if we look back at archives, they're not always kind to the people who wrote them a um, hundred years ago when we lived in a different America. Um, but I hope that if, as it changes, we continue to, to, to change with society and do more good from there, if all that makes sense. That our, our core mission is the same, but the way that we do it, I think changes as the world changes. Yeah. Monavet, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Desiree on the role of journalism in society. I think especially with the coronavirus pandemic, we could see like, just through numbers, like the obvious role, what people wanted was information about the virus, you know, how to stay safe. Um, you know, recently we launched um, an FAQ um, for people um, for questions about the virus. And that's been hugely popular. So I think like our role is always to serve our communities. Um, and how, uh, how do I see that changing at all in the future? I think that social media has made it so that like for the first time in a long time, your readers are able to like talk to you directly and able to complain to you directly. <laughs> and people um, in communities that were often ignored by um, other or past journalism are now like 
coming out and holding us accountable. And so I think that there's that change in like power. Whereas before we're just kind of like, you know, and all seeing something on the hill, you know, far away from the communities we may have covered. I think like that power transfer is happening now where like our community, uh, communities are saying like, I don't like how you cover this, you know, this isn't fair. And especially like bringing about like issues of, um, you know, race and, and um, the role of like, you know, what white supremacy looks like, what supremacist systems look like in institutions, what systemic racism looks like. All of that is from like communities, I think like finally like being on social media and having that voice to say like, this is wrong. Like you shouldn't cover it this way. Um, there are also these like aspects to consider. So I think that's um, how it's changing. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting to think about journalism as something being reported for the people and that you guys are working for these individuals who either don't have a voice or may not be hearing the same voice and just getting a different perspective, which I think can tie into advocacy. And I'd be interested to know your guys' thoughts about advocacy in journalism um, and trying to separate that from your personal beliefs or whether that ties into um, your reporting as well. You know, I, I think that um, this, this past year in particular um, with both the pandemic and the, the protests that followed the death of, of George Floyd um, has been an interesting year where there's been a lot of de debate within journalism communities about bias and, um, and, and activism and advocacy and all of that. And, um, and it's, it's one of those things where I think that if your, your center point is sort of truth and equity, then I think that you don't have a problem with, with bias. And, and it's, I, I think that every part of journalism includes human decisions. And, and I think that our, unfortunately, the way that people who try to call journalists out for activism or advocacy um, view it, sometimes it, it seems as though any story that <laughs> talks about race and really lays bare the reality of, of life for a lot of people can be considered advocacy when in, in reality I think it's just truth and it feels different because it's a truth that was ignored for a long time. I think that it was in choosing stories when there was less diversity in the newsroom, when there was um, like Bonavette said, before social media, when the voice of the community was much quieter, um, it may have seemed like there was less advocacy, but in reality, I think we were just able to ignore communities and those voices were still there. And, and now it's about giving those voices that have always been there a fair shake and, and a fair chance to be heard. Um, so I, I don't consider, advocacy journalism as some separate thing. I think it's all just journalism and it's all about hearing a diverse set of voices that represent the community fully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like also like just the fact that like what what is like considered neutral, like the neutral is most often like a perspective centered around like white voices mm -hmm. or, or whiteness. And that's like been like the domineering voice in newspapers for a long time. I think especially like when you do start like when we did stories about the Okoye massacre, you know, that are not that are are just about like setting the record straight, right? On what what we know happened, you know, and uh the newspaper, uh the Orlando Sentinel or what used to be the Orlando Sentinel at the time was incredibly racist, incredibly like supportive of the the mob that that killed um like an unknown number of people. Um, and so now we're with that project that like Desiree led, like we're setting the record straight and also like calling out like the continuing inequities that happen that are like document, like you can see in numbers that like, you know, it's not just like, well, you know, uh, black people feel that there's racism. No, no, no. Like there's like, you know, have like less wealth, um, you know, higher infant mortality rates, all of those things that can be documented, but that somehow seen as like, 
you being partial. Like, no, no, that's like a, a fact that these things are happening. And just because we're pointing them out doesn't mean that like, um, that I think that that's some advocacy. It's just like, like Desiree said, like us like telling the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a truth that I think has, was ignored for so long that it, for people who are not used to hearing it, who don't know what it's like to live it, it might seem like advocacy when this is just really unveiling this other world that always existed. Mm -hmm. And what was it like working on or leading that project Desiree to kind of correct those truths about the Akele massacre? So when you asked about my favorite story, I feel like I picked a story that was really the one that shifted something for me in journalism. Mm -hmm. But um, writing about the, the anniversary of the Okoye massacre was was really interesting just because of the, the, the timing of it. Um, like I mentioned, obviously, the, the, we were covering the protests um, for um, following the death of George Floyd. And um, I was actually, um, I've only just recently moved back to Orlando. Um, I was actually in Memphis, um, in Tennessee, when those protests broke out there. And, um, and it was a moment of, like, when the first protest started in Memphis, I was a business reporter, you know, and this was not, it, it wasn't, for for lack of a better way to say it, it, it was it wasn't my job to be there, um, but there was something in me that made me have to be there. And I remember um, being up till one in the morning that first night and watching the tweets of my colleagues and and seeing the emails go back and forth about how some of them were about to go home and the protest wasn't quite over yet and there was a ton of cops out there. And I remember emailing my editor and saying like, if some people need to go home because they've been there literally all night. Um, I'm awake. I'm not going to bed until this is over anyway. I'm happy to go out there. And um, and watching that first weekend of protests just sort of explode. And, and I remember there was just one moment where um, I watched a woman just get tackled in the street uh, by police officers in Memphis, um, just a few feet away from me. And, um, and I happened to be uh, recording a video at the time so I caught it on video and I can hear my own voice in the background as I am trying to back away and I bumped into a police officer and I'm telling him I'm a member of the press and and thankfully um, in Memphis the police officers did respect that that did not happen in, in every city um, but the last story I did in Memphis was this woman several months later finally willing to talk about her experience and then um, literally that the day I turned that story was my last day of work and then I packed up all my stuff and I moved to Orlando and immediately my first assignment was um, to start putting together um, a story about the Okoye massacre and um, it was just a moment in our present that that felt so significant to history as well and um it was the story that I that I, I did in the project was one about um, voter suppression. And it was about how there was just framing the Okoye massacre in terms of there were just these people, um, this group, this assembly of black um, people who lived in Okoye, Okoye residents who just wanted to vote. And their desire to vote was what kickstarted just one of the worst election day massacres. Um, in our history. And to me, it was obviously an ugly history, but an important one to, to talk about today, given the backdrop of George Floyd and given what was to come that obviously at the time we didn't know, but January 6th in Washington, D.C. Um, at the Capitol. And, and to see that while our world has changed drastically, the past is not that far back. And it's, there are still lingering echoes of what the country that we live in and our history. And um, I was glad to be able to come here and report on it and in a state that I love, that I grew up in, that I had known my whole life. Um, it meant a lot. That was a very long answer <laughs> to no, that no, question. No, but. That was great. It's because especially looking at you're reporting on something that happened a hundred years ago that like you said that wasn't that far away mm -hmm. and 
it happened right in our backyard. And I remember seeing all these protests and knowing the context of we're working on this exhibit and this is still happening now and seeing how it was being reported and how differently it was being reported than a Koei was a hundred years ago. Um, it, was, it was just really interesting for me to watch. That's why I appreciate your answer of connecting those two together. Um, we'll jump into the next one unless you have anything to add, Monavet. No, no, I, I agree with that. I agree with all. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit quickly um, about Marion Breckner, who uh, she was the director of Mid Florida Television, um, which was Channel Nine with her husband Joseph Breckner, and she served as the director of Community Affairs. Um, she was in charge of promotion for the station, and she produced special programming as well, which included um, a daytime television show called Orbit which she described as public service with a flair. Um, but even then that program was criticized for using taboo words like breast or uterus. Um, so she was really trying to have these discussions happen on air that at a time were not happening in the 1960s. And that's kind of what their station was all about. Um, the Breckners used their platform to openly campaign for civil rights. Um, and whenever topics of race were being addressed, they made sure to bring white and black community leaders and members together to discuss these issues rather than just reporting on it themselves. Um, so we touched on this a little bit with the last one, but I think it's still interesting to learn some more about, um, do you guys believe that diverse representation among journalists has any kind of impact on how news is reported? Um, I'll let Monavet kick this one off. Uh, short answer is yes, um, <laughs> very much. Um, I think that, um, you know, I've been in newsrooms where, you know, um, I'm like, there are, you know, no people, no, no people of color or, um, you know, I'm the only Latina, like, and um, it definitely like leads to just like straight up ignoring communities, like just not, covering them or covering them again, like from this hill from afar, like look what they're doing and, and not really like engagement. Um, I think that, you know, because of that, like, um, I, I like to think of like journalism as not like, not a way for us to be the voice of the voiceless, but a way for us to be a platform for those people where they can stand and be seen. Um, and I think that that platform, you know, really what isn't, when there are no, um, you know, journalists of color, journalists who are LGBTQ, journalists who are, you know, of different ethnicities, uh, of different uh, genders, there's not, that platform doesn't exist uh, for those other people. Um, and so I think like, um, you know, for example, like the Okoye massacre stuff that we, that we did, I think that like, if we didn't have Desiree's perspective, what what were we doing right like what are, you know what are you're missing the perspective of uh, um you know people that look like her if you don't have um the perspective of um you know uh if you only have the perspective of men you're missing the perspective of like half the population so um that's that's what i i think um i definitely think that um you know hopefully we need to increase um, the amount of, of diversity in journalism to be able to see all those perspectives. Yeah, absolutely. Desiree? And I, I agree. Um, I think that having people from different walks of life not only helps you come up with a wider range of story ideas, but it also for the people who, um, who are telling their stories. Um, I think that I know personally, um, as I've written about and interviewed Black women, I've been told that it's nice that they're able to talk to another Black woman about this. And, um, and, and it's, and I think if you can establish that level of comfort just out of the gate, I think that you can get better stories. And, and, and not to say that um, if you're a white man, you can't be good in journalism, but it, I think that there are opportunities where 
as a black woman, I just see life differently. I experience life differently. And because of that, I can see stories and certain things that others may overlook. And, um, and I would say that's the same for people across religions, sexualities, uh, ethnicities, race, income levels, um, everything. And, and I think that journalism in particular too, especially when you get to like the, the big, the New York Times and the Washington Post um, often have a, a, a reputation for being sort of elitist, that if you didn't go to Columbia Journalism School or something like that, um, you don't even get an opportunity to be in those rooms. And I, and I think that I, I'm glad to say that we are, as we talk about race, as we talk about all of those things, um, that's becoming a part of the conversation as well, because I think that someone who grew up similarly to some of the people that we want to write about in underserved communities, for example, um, there's just a shorthand that exists. There's a comfort level, there's an understanding, there's a, a view into someone else's life as an equal versus um, the way that Manavet described it earlier as sort of someone at the top of the hill looking down and, and I don't know, see, and telling stories of people that you don't really understand. Um, I think that it's incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, mean I think also, especially, sorry to cut you off, um, that's like my bad. Um, <laughs> but, um, I remember doing a story with um, a Hurricane Maria survivor who came over um, after the hurricane and was staying in a Motel 6. And I would like go to her her motel room after work and, and just like sit with her and her family. And she only knew, uh, she knew some English, little English, but um, mostly Spanish and her kids knew Spanish, you know, and so there are things that like we were able to connect with jokes that like, you know, you get or, or just like, you know, just like, you know, her cooking, um, I, she was Puerto Rican and um, my family, my dad's half is Cuban, but they were like cooking the same meals, um, you know, the same chuleta, you know, arroz, like, and so all of that um, made it its way into my reporting, but like helped me connect with her on like a different level. And obviously like, like you can, how do you, you can, there, there's like a humanity that you can see it's obvious to you. And sometimes in other people's reporting, it doesn't come off that way. The, the, the humanity part just isn't seen. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the direction where I was going to go was saying, um, with Desiree's example of the New York Times and the Washington Post, it's almost like being at, I don't want to say a smaller, but being at, in a community paper that you guys are reporting in your community, on your community, you get to connect with these people and connect with people that feel comfortable. And then it changes the reporting, like you said. And I don't know if that would be the same case if it was the Washington Post coming and reporting on the same story. Um, it's a really interesting comparison. And I think seeing and hearing you guys talk about what connections you've been able to make, it shows in the reporting and it shows in the quality of your guys' work as well. Thank you, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did spend some time reading some of your guys' stuff before this. So I did a little <laughs> bit of research. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll kind of jump into the next question. If I can find my mouse, geez. Um, of, what would you guys say the biggest challenge you face is as a journalist? Um, we'll start with, with Desiree on this one because you're making a face at me. <laughs> uh, I think that journalism is a career of challenges. I think that <laughs> it's just, it just is. It's, it's a career that gets you used to talking to people who obviously don't want to talk to you. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I think when I think about challenges for my current position, my uh, the the battle that I'm always trying to overcome um, right now is just a lack of data. Honestly, I, I think that um, when I'm writing about race, um, we talked about sort of advocacy and bias and all of those earlier, and I think one of the ways that I I'm I, make an effort to um, 
sort of remove that as an argument against my reporting is to to have the data whenever I can to, to back it up. Um, and unfortunately, data is not always available. And there are things that we know sort of to be true from just living life um, in minority communities in particular. Um, that's the we that I'm talking about there. Um, but it can be really difficult to to, to take those anecdotes and, and make them plain um, because this is still like the same systems that create issues in minority communities are not generally excited about uh, collecting data points to prove those. <laughs> um, so I think that as a reporter who writes about race, my biggest challenge, um, generally speaking, is uh, finding data to go along with my with the anecdotes and the the real life stories of people um but again journalism is a career of uh like <laughs> to use a a, a so, sort of socially acceptable versus journalism acceptable <laughs> um how people sort of don't want to double text someone like you text someone you don't want to text them again before they've had a chance to respond that's not a thing you text people over and over you call people over and over you know that they don't want to talk to you you reach out anyway um so there's a lot of rejection involved in journalism that's just yeah. no matter what you're working on that's your challenge going in <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I saw someone like do an email, like a parody of a journalist email that's like, hey, just reaching out. Please, I, I know you hate me. It's okay if you hate me. Just please write back. Like, and that, that is accurate. That is what it is. Just rejection like, over rejection. Yeah. Um, I would say some of my biggest challenges, like just as an individual journalist is like, like Desiree said, the data, also like public records mm -hmm. and access to public records. Um, it's, you know, the legislature puts uh, new exemptions uh, every year, uh, in particular, like, uh, uh, I wrote about this, like, last year, but the lawyers who, um, the attorneys for guardians decided it would be, like, a good idea to make, like, all guardianship cases confidential. <laughs> they want, that's a, that's a plan that they wanted to do, and that would have, like, effectively shut us out of, like, I think basically like 90% of the stories that we did on guardianship. Um, so it's just that like little, just attacks on, on pub, the public records law, the ability to get them from agencies. Um, and, but I think journalism as a whole, like I think our, our struggle is like dwindling resources, um, you know, from, you know, ad revenue or revenue that we're missing out on from, you know, uh, tech giants like Google, Facebook, et cetera, to like, uh, you know, being taken over by a hedge fund, which is happening to the Sentinel right now. <laughs> so, um, you know, just the, the lack of resources to do community journalism is, uh, you know, it, it's dwindling. And um, I think that's like a problem for, you know, Central Florida in general, that means that you don't have like a major source of of information uh, in your community is gone. I think, I think last I heard, the Orlando Sentinel employs the most journalists out of any news organization in Orlando. So, taking away those resources takes away like all that information that, especially vital information during COVID, um, that the community could have had. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it has a longer impact on that too by taking away this industry even will impact the area and the region beyond just not having that source of news. Um, which I think could be an interesting transition to our next question, because I'm trying to keep an eye on the time too, um, of in our current news climate, um, do you think that media outlets have a role in teaching news literacy? I know kind of like you mentioned, dwindling resources is an issue, but um, is this something that should still be a role um, as we're moving forward? Um, I, I say yes. I think that um, one of the challenges I think it, it, when it comes to news literacy is that um, sometimes I think the community does not always understand the sort of standards of journalism. So while this is a very fast paced um, 
industry, generally speaking, I think there are some stories that can happen a little bit slower because we need to do the reporting. And, um, and it's, from the outside, it can look like the paper doesn't care or we're not doing enough or we're not doing this, this reporting on this, whatever issue is. And in reality, um, what we're doing is collecting the information um, or a story will publish and, and we'll get criticism that says, well, what about these things that you didn't include in the story? And, and oftentimes it's, it's that we've published what we could in this moment and we'll come back to it. And um, I think that, at least personally, whenever people um, have questions about my reporting, I do try to answer them. Or if there is something that I know that is missing from a story when it's published, um, I might even just acknowledge it before anyone even asks about it. Um, for in a quick examples, I know we're, we're tight on time. <laughs> um, but when I was in Memphis, um, we celebrated the 200th year of being a city. Um, and as a business reporter, one of the stories that I wrote during that time was a story about um, Cotton Row. It was a row of buildings um, where cotton merchants used to work out of. And, um, and in the end, and Cotton Row obviously has generally speaking been defunct for a hundred years, for a long time. Um, and it's in the story that I ended up writing um, about some of the people who are still in the cotton industry, which sort of blew my mind. I, I don't know, there's a cotton industry. It shouldn't be surprising, but it feels surprising because I feel like when you think of cotton, you think of slavery, but, <laughs> but I also are clothes are made of cotton. Anyway, um, the people who I could talk to who had like family members who used to work on Cotton Row, the ones that were the easiest to find were the people whose names were on buildings. And those generally speaking were white people. So the story was um, told some of the black perspective of what it was like to work on Cotton Row, but most of the quotes were coming from um, the white families, the descendants of people who had worked there. And when I, I remember when I shared the story, um, on Twitter, I shared the link and the one of the very first things that I said was, there are not many black voices in this story. And I explained the history and the reason why and, and the fact that it's much more difficult to find descendants of the, the black men who were moving the bales of cotton versus the white men whose names were on the buildings. Um, and what I found was that instead of turning into sort of an angry conversation about who was left out of the story, it turned into a conversation on Twitter um, of people sort of understanding and saying, yeah, that makes sense, I understand that. And I think that had I not sort of gone from a, a angle of sort of news literacy, if you wanna call it that, and said up front, this is why the reporting looks the way that it does, um, I think it would have been a a pretty different response from the public and um, a different response in my emails as well. <laughs> wow. um, and, and I think that that is an example of the value of explaining how our reporting comes together and why it looks the way that it does. Yeah, yeah. that's a, I think like a really like good example. I haven't, I don't have a lot of examples of like teaching news literacy, honestly, because sometimes on social media, it's so hard when the comments and um, sometimes uh, people are, are engaging you in bad faith. So it's sometimes hard to tell, like tell when at the moment that you should be doing that. But I do think that media outlets do have a role in teaching news literacy. I also think that there's a role for, for um, readers to not help change that literacy, but help steer it in a different direction. I'm thinking of like with mugshots, um, you know, there's been like a controversy over newspapers publishing, um, you know, mugshot galleries for, um, for content, for clicks, and your Orlando Sentinel, like, recently stopped publishing the mugshot galleries. If there's, like, a, you know, murder, a major violent crime, we will publish the mugshot um, in that story only, but um, there's, like, good conversations for readers and uh, newspapers to engage in, and, like, what readers like actually need like readers a lot of times reached out to us about the mugshot galleries and how they were not 
uh, not helpful to the community and just put people out there for no reason. Um, I think in terms of like, especially like the vaccine, like, you know, readers are telling us in that instance what they want, what they find most helpful. Um, so I think that like, there should be just this open, a better way to like open this communication. For, so for the community to tell us like what they actually need, um, what's actually useful to them. Yeah, just be as transparent as possible and allow for that back and forth. Yeah. I think it's interesting too, how you're talking about these people on social media often aren't engaging with you in um, from a good point of view to start with. And it reminds you of something that uh, Desiree was saying that came to my mind that you guys also are people like you're journalists, but you're still people who have to protect yourselves and your mental health. So in terms of like navigating such a fast paced uh, industry and hearing from one side, maybe that you're not reporting on something because like Desiree said, you're just collecting the information still, you're still doing the research. And then Bonavit, I'd be interested to hear, um, I know we don't have much time, but I'd be interested to hear you talk a little bit about what it was like having to report on something so difficult like the Pulse nightclub shooting um, and kind of the things that you can do to protect yourself um, while you're working on that. I did not do a very good job <laughs> of protecting myself during that. It's hard to do that um, when like for Pulse, it was extremely hard to do that. And I don't think I did that well, to be honest. I think looking back, um, you obviously like need to to take some time off like just there you need to someone needs to be able to tell you hey like you need to take some time off um there definitely needs to be like more um i think resources like offered to journalists in that time um you know when you're reporting on heavy issues um i i think the thing that people um, may not like think of right away is that like, you know, for, for Pulse, when you're, you know, for example, the weekly did like um, stories for all 49 victims, like shorter stories, just about their lives. And that would often involve like calling parents and calling family members. And so, you know, you're on the phone, them like crying, you're crying, like you're like absorbing you know, all that they have to say, it, it definitely takes a toll. So there should be, I think, just more, you know, resources out there and a way for, you know, journalists that are dealing with us to be able to get away, take some time off and like, uh, be able to, to recharge, even from like, um, you know, and that can happen, it doesn't happen to me, but that can happen with like, I think I've been desensitized at this point, but like normal reporting on criminal justice is, can be traumatic, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot. So there has to be that space to be able to take some time away and uh, away from that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen real quick so I can kind of look and see if we have any questions maybe. I, maybe not. All right. Okay, so since we don't have any questions, or if you do have a question, feel free to put it um, in the chat and we can definitely discuss them. But in the meantime, I will ask the last question that I just closed out of the, the presentation. Um, if you could have lunch with any journalist, any journalist at all, who would it be and why? Desiree, okay. you want to go first? <laughs> um, so I'll give two. Um, sort of one living, one dead. <laughs> um, first dead, I think that um, Ida B. Wells. No. Is, <laughs> Ida B. Wells, we could have lunch with her together. Well, are you going to say Nicole Hannah-Jones as the second uh, one? Well, yes. No. <laughs> I was going to say Nicole Hannah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Me, Monavet, Ida B. Wells, Nicole Hannah-Jones. It would be great. <laughs> um, and then there's this other, I should have looked her name up before we started. Her first name is Hannah, and I forget her last name, but she did a story with ProPublica 
2017, 2018, and I just never forgot it. It was a story about um, a 17 year old kid who was a member of MS 13. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it was the 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 lead of the story. The first paragraph of the story was something like, "If this kid is killed, this will be why." And she lays out a whole story about how. Um, he became um, sort of an, an, an informant and um, gave uh, our federal government a lot of information about uh, members of this gang that he was a part of at risk of his own life. And um, the government then um, arrested a bunch of people based on his information and then also arrested him uh, based on the information they gave him and put him in the same um, jail as all the people. Oh. Um, and threatened to deport him as well. And, and it was really a situation that if he was deported, it would put his, put his life in danger. Um, and it was just uh, a fascinating story that was well told, that was sensitive to the issue and was just amazing. And I believe she won a Pulitzer for it. Um, if she didn't, she was cheated. <laughs> but it was just incredible. Fascinating, yeah. A lot of that. Yeah, I would say um, Nicole Hannah Jones, obviously, like she's known for her 16, uh, 19 project, which was amazing. But I think that she did a project before them that I really loved um, for ProPublica. And I think This American Life on segregation in uh, New York schools and how, you know, parents who considered themselves liberal, you know, I'm not racist were still perpetuating segregation uh, in schools and how it like specifically affected her daughter. And I just thought like, like I heard that and I was like, she's the smartest person in journal. Like she was just so like, this the resources she pulled. She's like every like, every data journalist like dream. And also she's like her, like her audio, like she, she is a print journalist she was able to do like this audio version of the story that was amazing. Um, and I, I think second, I would do um, Maria Garcia. She is a um, the reporter behind the Anything for Selena podcast that recently oh. came out and it is so good. She just has so much like, you know, and, and the, if, for those who don't, you who don't know, Selena Quintanilla like was a um, Tejana singer who was killed and uh, her impact on um, uh, Chicanos and, and Latinx people is like immense, like cannot be measured, but just her, the podcast focuses on like the politics of uh, Selena's uh, derriere, like just uh, like Selena's uh, race, like Selena's like, um, you know, Spanglish. It's just, it's all encompassing, it's so good. So I would, I would have lunch with her. <laughs> They all sound amazing. I would like to uh, crash that lunch, please. Um, so we do actually have one question and I know we're like almost out of time, but uh, we have a question for Desiree. Um, I'm also someone who left journalism for another career track and found it interesting that you found your way back to it. What inspired you to return and would you recommend it to someone at those crossroads? Um. <laughs> First, I'll say, I think if I would have just taken more vacation time, I probably would not have left journalism in the first place. I think this goes back to just taking care of yourself and 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 just knowing when you need a break. Um, and at the time, I was helping to work on this project that looked at police use of force in Orlando. And, um, and this was like just after Ferguson. So this was after Trayvon Martin, but before this like moment that we're in right now. And um, I think that that took a lot out of me as a young black woman reporting on that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I probably would have been okay if I would have just taken more time off. <laughs> but um, I, I think that I, I sort of hit a wall. I was burnt out, I was exhausted. I needed to just try something else. Um, I was I was out of journalism for about two to two and a half years before I, I found my way back. Um, and I think that the reason I came back was 
the same reason that I got into journalism in the first place, that this just felt like work that mattered. It felt like um, I had an opportunity to give people a voice, um, to raise the voices of other people, to correct wrongs that had been perpetuated for a long time. Um, and also to just have fun. I think while when we talk about why journalism is important, we do talk a lot about the serious aspect, but I think it's just fun. I think it's just a cool job. I think that every time I ever tell anyone that I'm a journalist, the response is, really? And not every job has that. So I'm not gonna tell you to get back into journalism <laughs> because it's a grind. Um, and uh, as we were talking about challenges, I think there was, um, I was trying to think like, what's the list of things that are not challenging about journalism? And uh, I'm not sure what would go on that list. Um, so it's a grind, it's hard, but it's also a lot of fun. And you feel not every day, but most days like you either are doing something important or you can be doing something important. And um, that's why I love it. That's why I see myself in it for a long time. I might take a break again at some point, um, but I think that I would always come back to this in some capacity. Well, we're about out of time, but thank you so much. Um, really appreciate both of you guys taking the time to speak with us today and just being so open and candid with all of your answers and learning about your experiences. Um, I am going to invite Katie back to kind of talk about some upcoming programs that we have going on at the History Center. But again, thank you so much. Um, could not have been a better panel, in my opinion. <laughs>